Mr. Speaker, there, there can be no question that this is a major piece of, of legislation that seeks to remedy a major lacune, that seeks to <coughs> remedy a major problem in our commercial law and practice and at the same time, um, modernize commercial behavior and practice in St. Lucia and bring us up to speed with other jurisdictions. I think, Mr. Speaker, that the Attorney General draw attention to the history of, of this bill indicating that the idea of the bill was first presented to this House in a budget statement or thrown speech sometime in 2014. And uh, contrary to what has been said, there was no draft prepared by 2016 that one could have had an oversight of it because it was a work in progress. And the former government also ought to be commended for indicating that they too had every intention to enact an insolvency bill. Although at the time I had to remind the then Minister of Finance and the member for Miku South that in fact the idea of the insolvency bill came from the former Labour administration and that he was merely continuing what had started. Let me at the outset say that I wholeheartedly support this legislation. And uh, like the member for Denry South who spoke a few minutes before me, I congratulate the Attorney General and what the member for Swazel calls his maiden performance in the House seeking to explain the bill the history and the purpose of the legislation. But almost immediately I concur and say with him that this bill will require massive public education to explain the purpose of the bill, the provisions of the bill, and the implications of the bill. Because I sense there may be some misunderstanding of the purpose and objective of this piece of legislation. It's going to be very, very important that this be explained carefully to members of the public so that they understand its implications and the transformation that the bill is seeking to create in the society. So, Mr. Speaker, I wholeheartedly support this legislation, whatever comments I make must not be taken to be any criticism of the bill. I mean, there are people, the moment you open your mouth and say something in this house, they tell you you're criticizing, you're criticizing. Nah. Um, but at the very outset, let me also say, Mr. Speaker, that I welcome the language of the legislation. Insolvency is a difficult and complex subject because it is part and parcel of the commercial law of this country and there are in fact provisions in our old commercial code that this insolvency bill is effectively repealing. So it is not that we never had any kind of legislation, it's just that what we had had become so um, shall we say, so, so useless that there was no need for it. it, it, it that commerce, commercial activity in this country had gone way past that. That was enacted way back in the past when St. Lucia was just trying to, 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 to find, its, find its feet. So, um, Mr. Speaker, let's, let's be very clear. Um, let's be very, very clear about it. But to the credit of the drafters of this legislation, the provisions 
are drafted elegantly, simply, and I can also sense that great effort was made to edit this bill to minimize the potential for pitfalls and to minimize the potential for issues and to minimize the possibility that honorable members of the House may find gaps, lacunae, contradictions, mm -hmm. infelicities, if I may use that word, Mr. Speaker. And the drafters are very proud of that accomplishment, Mr. Speaker. Very proud of it. But of course, it depends on who they're talking to. And so, <laughs> but, Mr. Speaker, they're undeniably, Mr. Speaker, they have to be complimented because a, a great effort was made. And I did ask the Attorney General this morning in a passing conversation, well, where did you get your model legislation from? And he did give me some indication and some of the provisions came partly from UK legislation, but interestingly, a lot of the provisions apparently came from the Canadian legislation. And um, I'm all, I am an admirer of the drafting style of the Canadians. The Canadians understand English. And they draft with a clarity and lucidity that sometimes um, is beyond comparison. And if you look at even the Companies Act, Mr. Speaker, you will see what I'm talking about. So I just want to say to St. Lucians, complex as this bill may be with, I mean, it's a bill of 274 pages, and I believe 400 and what? Four, um, gracious, 426 provisions. Um, nevertheless, it is um, readable if you have the time to do it. And I support that kind of drafting because it is populist drafting. Populist in the sense that you are trying to make the laws accessible to people and that you are avoiding um, this fasciculus of, of provisions that are complex, bewildering, meandering, etc. So to some extent, I think a lot of credit has to be given to the drafters. I, I'm concerned it has taken us 10 years, Mr. Speaker, 10 years years for this legislation to make an appearance um, in Parliament. And uh, Mr. Speaker, and it, it, it really touches on an issue which I have raised from time to time, um, our ability to, to get things done, this constant um, tendency to, to delay, to procrastination in the system. But be that as it may, the fact is that the legislation is, is before us. I would imagine, Mr. Speaker, in a couple of years' time, we'll have to come back here and amend this bill. And I noted in passing there's actually a provision that allows the supervisor, I believe it is, to review the act. There's an actual provision that allows the supervisor. I am not happy with how the section is worded because no supervisor should be reviewing any act. They're qualified to do that. They should be reviewing the experiences with implementing the act. That's a more technical matter how you review an act in terms of assessing the provisions, etc. But be that as it may, the intent, the understanding is present here that um, we will have to come back to this um, over time. Mrs. Speaker, a few little issues, minor little issues that I just want to, to look at very, very, very quickly before I make some, some other points. The bill is very careful to say that both the trustee as well as the supervisor will be appointed by the Public Service Commission. Very, very clear. If you look at section six, clause six rather, and clause 10 in that regard. I am to some extent concerned that the bill is going to be, the legislation is going to be administered by a unit um, within the Ministry of Finance. I um, 
Mr. Speaker, I am not so sure whether the Minister of Finance should really be, be burdened with administering this legislation. And that that unit ought to be placed within the Ministry of Finance. I really don't know, Mr. Speaker. To be honest with you, I would have thought that the appropriate department for the administration of that bill should have been the Office of the Attorney General because of the nature of the process that we are dealing with. But again, Mr. Speaker, it is a matter of judgment. The second observation I would wish to, to make in that regard, Mr. Speaker, it would have been very good if the qualifications of those two individuals, the supervisor and the trustee, um, was specified in the legislation. You know, public service commissions can be wayward entities, Mr. Speaker. Can be wayward entities. And in private practice, I have seen enough evidence to see even the Public Service Board of Appeal ignores the very laws of the country by what they choose to give in their decisions. I've had, a, I've had that experience. It's a bewildering experience, uh, Mr. Speaker. And it would have been good if the qualifi qualifications of both of these individuals, because the key to the administration of this bill is really to have highly competent technocrats applying this bill. You can't just have appoint anybody as a supervisor or anybody as a trustee. In fact, you're looking for a peculiar kind of animal, really. And by that I mean, Mr. Speaker, a person who has some understanding of law, a person who has some understanding of accounting, a person who has some understanding of, um, yes, um, finance, and you can't trust an economist with this. They're caused mayhem. An economist can never understand this. They're caused mayhem. I'm very serious. No, 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 no. I'm deadly serious. <laughs> Who caused mayhem? Lawyers has caused mayhem as well, says the member for, um, for library. Let me tell you something. <laughs> there are two professions in which that understand the lives of people and ordinary people, politicians and lawyers. That's why a lot of politicians want to be lawyers. That's why a lot of them wish they were lawyers. <laughs> so the two of them meet at that point because of their concern for people, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you this. And let me explain, Mr. Speaker. And you, you can see this philosophy at work here, you know, because in this bill, it's obvious that protection for insolvency matters is extended to protect fishers and agriculturalists and so on, etc. But in a particular context of insolvency, and that's where the politicians and the lawyers meet, tending to the needs of people and putting people first and so on. But the politicians have severe limitations. They can't solve many problems at all. And when people want their problems to solve as the lawyers, they have to come to Mr. Speaker. And you see, we lawyers, more than anybody else, solve the real problems of people. That's why people, that's why people can't do without us. We are here in Parliament enacting this, uh, this piece of legislation. Who knows, we might well be causing a multiplicity of problems of people. That's what we do when we pass legislation sometimes. We cause problems to people. So, Member for Library, be cautious how you make such comments because you add to the problems of the world. You don't add to the resolution of issues. Lawyers do. That's the big difference. So, um, I mean, I know you waived your right to speak a while ago so <laughs> because you declined. But having said this, Mr. Speaker, I just want, simply want to say that it would have been good, this 
bill would have been strengthened if we had these provisions regarding the qualifications for the appointment of those, uh, of the, of those individuals. The second thing that I just want to draw attention to very quickly, Mr. Speaker, sometimes <laughs> when we draft legislation, we err on the side of caution and we want to be all things to all men. Administratively, it's going to be quite a challenge for this bill to, to work because of the checks and balances that, that, are in this that are in this bill. I can't recall seeing a, a piece of legislation in recent times where there's so many checks and balances. And to be honest with you, I am reminded of my constant criticism of previous legislation that we're not doing enough to protect people and empowering people. In this instance, we have done, I think, a lot to protect people and to seek to, to, to ensure that um, abuse is minimized. But you see, Mr. Speaker, while that is a case, on the other hand, it could be that we have gone overboard into the extent of the protections we have. And you just have to look at the, the amount of protections in this legislation that we concede to, uh, um, we concede to um, an insolvent person. Every step along the way, they have an opportunity to contest, um, to appeal. And it's a remarkable future, a remarkable feature of, of, the, of the legislation, and I certainly applaud it. But at the same time, I'm concerned about whether this could work. Now, Mr. Speaker, the member for Swazel told about says, well, who, which master did this bill serve? Now, this one coming from him, this was, this was, this was surprising. Um, but he's right that, that at the outset, that the World Bank routinely criticized St. Lucia for the absence of insolvency legislation. And every time, every time in St. Lucia that um, our performance in business matters was evaluated, reference was made to the fact that there is no insolvency legislation in, in St. Lucia. And it is for that reason that the World Bank specifically made funds available to produce, to help us to produce this, this legislation. But the question is, who, who is going to need it? And, it? and then you come to the question posed by the member. The fact of the matter is that the business community badly needs this legislation. Whether lawyers will be able to advise them correctly is the issue. But there's no question that the business community needs this legislation because day in, day out in St. Lucia, there are companies and commercial entities who are going out of business because they cannot manage their debts, they are overwhelmed. At least what the legislation does is to offer some degree of protection so that if they then have to deal with their mountain of debt, that they can seek um, to get some protection under the insolvency provisions of the legislation. Now that is critical and, 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 and that is crucial. But even more important than this, we do not even have an adequate system of ranking of liabilities, etc. And quite often what lawyers have to do is to go to court to secure a judgment to protect particular interests of individuals. And Mr. Speaker, 
what this seeks to do is to provide a framework for many of those who would be affected where bankruptcy is looming, insolvency is looming, to get some degree of protection. So that the protection extends not only to the owners of the properties, but also to those who have been clients, the consumers of those properties. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, that helps to answer the question posed by the member for Swazel that this, in fact, is a piece of legislation that not only commercial entities, companies, etc., will find useful, but also the critical the consumers who, time and time again, have to be faced with problems where companies are simply fading away and they have no means of redress, which, of course, the Companies Act cannot provide. The Companies Act was never designed to provide that kind of protection to, um, to clients of companies. So what this does is to resolve that kind of problem, and the issue again will have to be, will have to be the, 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 the matter of the administration of the, of the legislation. Mr. Speaker, so that this really is legislation um, for all, and um, at some point, I, because I suspect there's some looming con confusion between the boundaries of this legislation and the civil code, that will have to be explained. That will have to be explained at some point and explained to members of, of the public um, very, very carefully. Because, as I said, I suspect there is some confusion between the boundaries of the legislation of the two. Now, the member for Swazel also drew attention to Clause 4, um, which says, where a conflict exists between this act and the Civil Code of St. Lucia and any other act when this act prevails. <clears throat> And I think what he's really raising in his mind is how much of this act touches the, the civil code. It is a matter, Mr. Speaker. Yes, you may want to keep it on, on, on um, keep it under scrutiny, and that is why I make the point that it's going to be essential that the, the, the boundaries are are, um, are fully understood. But there's also a little matter. Um, of philosophy too, because you're dealing with two acts of parliament who enjoys equal status because they are both acts of the parliament of solution. So when they are of equal status and you don't take, you don't take the route of repealing or of, or of um, amending, then you can cause unnecessary issues. But I well, I'm not going to pursue it except to say that I believe in an abundance of caution in these matters sometimes, and where you're going to have provisions that clearly override other legislation to be, to be careful. And I don't see any harm when you look, let us say at Clause 78, for example, stay of proceedings in relation to a director. And, and this is really an awesome power in Clause 78. For where all of the directors have resigned or have been removed by their shareholders without replacement, a person who manages or supervises the management of the business and affairs of the cooperation is deemed to be a director for the purposes of the section. So the person is deemed a director for the purposes of the section. So this is overriding the Companies Act, telling the Companies Act in the abeyance. Now, this is surprising. The logic I can understand, because directors, of course, have all vacated and, and the rest of it, and no one to be associated. But I would have erred on the side of caution, and I might have wanted to add the words after, after this, uh, after the section of the business and affairs of the corporation, shall, notwithstanding the requirements of the Companies Act, 
is deemed to be a director for the purposes of this section. I'm looking at page 97. But of course, the drafters will tell me I'm just playing with words. I mean, that is not, that is not necessary. It is already there. But you know, <laughs> too often have I seen when we don't play with words to clarify words and we leave things for courts, we get into trouble of one kind or another. That reminds me, Mr. Speaker, I will, I will tell you of an experience I had so you can understand um, what, what I was, um, what I'm talking about, Mr. Speaker. I don't know if honorable members, Mr. Speaker, will remember when we enacted, um, when, we, when we enacted, I believe it was a co um, constituency, when we enacted the Labor, labor Act, the um, uh, Labor Code. And we had a provision um, in the Labor Code at the time um, to say that the Labor Act did not apply for servants of the crown. I think the more precise language was to public servants. And when this bill was being debated in the House, I indicated to the House that the reason why the executive put that provision was to ensure that employees of corporations such as the Castries City Council, etc., did not fall within the jurisdiction of the Labor Code. I don't know whether honorable members will <laughs> remember this, this conversation. That was said in, in, in Parliament, and that is why we didn't use the language, um, we used more precise language because the intention was to exclude it. Lo and behold, lo and behold, <coughs> I proceeded to court to get um, a judicial review of a certain matter, and the judge, on the threshold, agreed with, represent, with, agreed with the arguments of, of counsel that, in fact, um, the labor court protected the employees of corporations despite the clear intention and the clear will of parliament. Of course, I did not bring to, to, to court what was said in Parliament because, as you know, that, that's not of any significance. As far as the judge was concerned, is, is he could not understand, the judge could not understand the difference between who is a public officer and who is an officer of the Crown, a servant of the Crown. Because the fact of the matter is that the persons who were engaged in the Castries City Council were not public officers, they were not appointed by a public service commission, and the intention was to, ex um, to ex exclude them. But the judge couldn't understand this. I decided not to appeal the argument, because in any event, on the merits of the complaint, I knew I would have succeeded, and I didn't want to put the client through any extra difficulty. And lo and behold, when the matter did reach the Labor Commission and Labor Tribunal, um, judgment was, in, was rendered in favor of my client. But I'm just saying that we also have to be very careful because sometimes what we think is the intention of parliament is construed by a judge in different languages. Never, we never should never take risks, never take risks um, in parliament to believe that judges are on the same page with us. Because um, judges have their own motives and their, their own tools of interpretation sometimes. So we have to be exceedingly careful on these matters. Which brings me to another minor point on the administration of estates. <laughs> um, and I had to laugh at this one, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and I'm talking about um, Clause 287 which has a requirement of publication in newspapers. It says, a notice in the prescribed form must as soon as possible after the bankruptcy or not later than five days before the first meeting of creditors be published by the trustee in a newspaper of general circulation in St. Lucia. I'm looking at clause, it's on page 159, I'm looking at clause 208, sub clause 7. A 
exactly. Newspapers, uh, I don't know how much live newspapers have again, you know. Um, they're ceasing to exist. Those that exist. Yeah. Oh, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, little things like that we sometimes have to be a little careful about. And I, I, I wondered whether we can just, just add the words or in, the, the, um, or in the, the National Gazette or whatever for notices of publication because it's like, you see, the Gazette has a, some permanence to it because a lot of people don't know that the Gazette is constitutionally, actually constitutionally protected because of the references to its existence in one way or another. Um, so it, it, it might, it, 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 these are little things that we, we need to be um, a little careful, care, careful, careful about. Now, Mr. Speaker, I, huh? including the, the Gazette or, well, I mean, it's better in, um, in the Gazette, really, because electronic means could be so, yeah. Um, as I said, Mr. Speaker, I want to, I, I want to compliment the elaborate proposals to protect individuals. As I, I spoke about consumers who would have access, the efforts to protect the um, matri uh, man matrimonial property. But again, I believe that it's going to be very important that ed some education be done because it, this can be confusing for people to understand the regime in our civil code as against the regime of protection under this. Um, if you look at clause 181, and I know the Attorney General had drawn our attention to another, to, another, to another clause. I'm actually supporting what he said, but drawing attention to clause, um, to clause 181, that helps his case, he says, where a debtor who is married in community is at the date of bankruptcy the sole registered owner of the immovable property on which the matrimonial home is located and the immovable property does not exceed one acre, the spouse of the debtor may within 21 days following the bankruptcy claim an interest in the net proceeds from a sale or disposition by the trustee of the property after satisfaction of all valid and enforceable charges registered in the appropriate registry. Again, some degree of protection, but <clears throat> accessing the law might well be a challenge. Um, <clears throat> because she too has to contend against the valid and enforceable, and enforceable charges. But I make, I make the point um, that this, this, this explains the sensitivity, but the question then is really whether this is enough protection on its, on its, on its, on its merits. But Mr. <coughs> Attorney General, it is clearly a step in the, in the right, um, right direction. Now, Mr. Speaker, in my earlier remarks, I, I wanted also to give credit to the, to the drafters. I am always at the, always um, criticizing the drafters, sometimes in, explicitly or sometimes implicitly. Most of the times they ignore me. Most of the times they, they ignore me. Um, I don't know about every day. But sometimes I will meet them in court. I'll have to meet them in court sometimes on some occasions when they don't hear. Um, but what I will tell you, Mr. Speaker, is this. There has been a very deliberate attempt in this legislation, and this is what I commend, to recognize the status of the laws of St. Lucia and, and who we are, to go back to what fascinates the member for Swazel, this concept of legal identity. 
and what legal identity means. And um, I'm going to check him under my wings in the next few weeks and give him some literature to read so that he comes, he has a better grasp of this concept of legal identity to understand how it shapes who we are and what we are, what we are, and what a profound it can have on um, your outlook, your, ge your, your general, not just your general demeanor, but how you think and who you choose to follow. So I will take you on my wings in that regard and we can have a, a, a discussion. But Mrs. Speaker, um, if, you look at, if you look at the very section I'm quoting, they, they speak of immovable property. Same clause 181, Mr. Speaker. And I have seen other, other, other sections where they, where another section where they speak of servitudes. In other words, the language of our law, rather than and being, um, seeking to, to, be, to import English law without understanding the applicability and the value of English law. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to applaud, um, applaud these efforts but it is not enough to do this just once in this. You have to do it all the time. All the time. It must be done with every piece of legislation to respect and honor the legal traditions of this country. And you all don't understand why legal identity is important. We go and praise everything else about who we are and what we are but we don't understand that there's a legal culture underpinning us. That is why we are different. And why we have to applaud and praise differences. And when we speak of excellence, it has to be about all things and not just some things. And so, Mr. Speaker, um, they deserve recognition in, 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 in this regard. Mr. Speaker, this really is um, a major piece of legislation. As I said, there are little provisions I would quarrel with here and there and have issues with. But um, it's a major step. I mean, I don't even know whether the member for Miku sorry, for Denry South, even understand the depth and breadth um, of this. Because you see, those hotels who operate in St. Lucia and then close their doors and go under or for one reason or, or the other, um, they decide to cease operations and people get wind of what is happening and can't get protection. It means that your um, persons involved in products of agriculture and products of the sea get some degree of protection. If you look, Mr. Speaker, for example, to grasp what I'm getting at, if you look at clause, the, if you look at clause, I think it is two clause two, and um, page 49, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> and, and, and this is where the draft has made a little slip up, but never mind. I mean, If you look at products of agriculture, Mr. Speaker, it's on page 49. It says, the range of products that are brought into the mix that will allow for protection of that the member for Den Risado was talking about. Agri products of agriculture includes vegetables, fruits, grain. Now, I ain't too sure what kind of grain they mean. Hey, H-A-Y, hey, hey. But then, I don't know whether they're talking about, and the member for Beaufort North is smiling, I don't know whether they mean the grass they just cut and roll up and they call hey. But you see what happens when you take in um, indiscriminate definitions of roots and all other direct products of the soil. So grain, hay, roots, and then he goes on to say, and listen to his definition. Products of agriculture includes honey, 
livestock, whether alive or dead. <laughs> Dairy products, eggs, and all other indirect products of the soil. Now, we may, we may laugh, because, but I'm going to show you the over-caution. This, 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 the fact that this have been so cautious in this legislation. I mean, what they're really talking about are the egg producers, you know. So you know when they go egg, egg producers go and sell things to the supermarkets and so on, and they don't pay them, and to the hotels, and they don't pay them. You know there are some hotels in this country that have bad habits, eh? Exceedingly bad habits. So they take produce from farmers, and they don't pay them for, for months, and they cry all kind of cry. Um, then look at this definition. Products of the sea includes fish, marine, organic, and inorganic life, and a substance extracted or derived from the sea. Now, I don't know what they meant, sea moss. Must be sea moss they're talking about. So why didn't they put, um, huh? What? I didn't hear that. I mean, I, didn't, I don't know why, before these CMOS farmers, I don't know why they didn't call, call, say CMOS. That, that would have been an interesting answer. But again, it is the intent for me that, that matters, not the, the play with words. Um, although I would not have included some of these words, but it is the, the um, intent. And if you look at property, how property is defined, Money, goods, shows in action, accounts, receivables, inventory, equipment, intellectual property, land, and description of property. Very, 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 very wide. So, Mr. Speaker, I simply want to take the opportunity to give credit to the drafters of this legislation. Uh, my own training may have led me in different directions and some of the, um, some of the provisions, etc. but. I particularly respect the fact that they were sensitive to our law and they made a determined uh, um, effort. I have no hesitation in indicating my support for the, for the legislation, even if I may have referred to a few infelicities and a few matters. I must confess, however, that I am I'm very concerned about the provisions regarding the appointment of both the supervisor as well as the um, trustee, and that there should be an empowering subsection to say that um, the executive shall set the terms and conditions, I'm sorry, this executive shall set the qualifications required for these, for these posts. Now, um, just the final word, Mr. Speaker. You, you ask me then, why will I insist on that? I'll tell you why, Mr. Speaker. I'll tell you why. I gave you an example a while ago of what we think in Parliament may not be what a judge thinks and what we intend to enact may not be what a judge feel we have enacted. Because the judge will give one interpretation or his own interpretation of what we have done, even if we express words to the contrary. We also have wayward governments. We have wayward governments. And the reality is that we sit as reasonable men and women and assume that everybody else would subscribe to the same beliefs and to the same ideas, only to discover that that is not so. Well, you may embellish the argument by, <laughs> if you wish, by. Uh, by examples, yes, but my point is, my point is that Parliament sometimes need to speak with great clarity. Yes, unequivocally. 
so that the intent of Parliament is very clear that when we enact legislation, we must also enact it bearing in mind the, f the future because we cannot assume that what we believe the interpretation to be or what it is we have done will necessarily be honored five, ten years down the road. It may be interpreted very differently. So my point is, Speaker, and we, there's a term that we use in law, ex abundante cautela, out of an abundance of caution. And as I said to you earlier on, I see it in court all the time that what you believe a judgment is saying and what you believe parliament is saying, that the judge is telling you, no, that's not what you meant. That you meant something differently, even though you sit in parliament and you head up parliamentarians and you debate it. Because, as you know, um, while a, a judgment will quote well, um, what was said in parliament, it will have no regard to what was said in parliament because judges dismiss politicians. Judges really are very contemptuous of politicians, you know. They, dis they dismiss you all. Anything you say in Parliament have no value. It doesn't matter who it comes from, whether it comes from the Prime Minister or the Attorney General in his debut speech or whatever, they will disregard him and dismiss him. They have no interest in him. Serious. Except what? <laughs> well, I assume pronouncements in Parliament, yes, where salaries are concerned, claim it would probably matter. But my point is that it is best to err on the side of caution. Don't take chances with judges. Never take chances with judges. Member for library. Member for library. Um, sorry. Because you see you, you say one thing, they'll tell you that's not what you meant at all. You meant something very different. And, and um, other, your, your colleagues may have misunderstood what you were saying, but that is really what you meant. Yeah. So, <laughs> well. If he's in flight, it's worse. <laughs> it, it is worse. So, Mr. Speaker, um, just these little minor things, but um, I wouldn't want to repeat myself and to say 10 years is taken, 10 years too late, but nevertheless, it fills a major gap in our commercial law, and I do believe that. Um, the business community, the commercial community, will be very pleased by, uh, by this legislation. And it's one of those um, major pieces of legislation that we have to keep on a constant review to see how it is absolutely put into, uh, into practice. And I just simply underscore it all by saying, in a different way to what a member from Suzel was trying to say, when he was talking about the immense powers of the supervisor and the trustee, precisely because of the extraordinary powers assigned to them, we need provisions regarding their qualifications to hold the post. You cannot appoint ordinary mortals to handle those responsibilities. Mr. Speaker, I say no more, and I thank you for, for your patience in hearing me out.